Hello and welcome to Basics of Computers. In this video we will discuss the role that computers play in Starfinder, how they function within the game's rules, and we will build a foundation of information about computers that will be built upon in our next video which is all about computer security and hacking. Before we get into the mechanics of how computers work, let's talk a little about what the benefits are of having a computer. Why would a player want one and what purpose do they play in the game's narrative? Computers are largely freeform devices that can serve different purposes depending on the needs of the story. If the GM needs a way to pass information to the players, she might hide it in the files of a computer. If the game needs a MacGuffin to draw the players to a certain location, a specific file on a computer might be that bait. And if a combat heavy game needs a skill encounter to give a break in the action, well, hacking a computer to open an important door might be the answer. So the functions and stats of computers in Starfinder are flexible and often rely more on the needs of the story than anything else. Likewise, players more often than not purchase computers strictly for role-playing purposes. A technomancer might want a sophisticated data pad to store their spells, a scientist might carry a computer to secure their research, and any player might want a portable AI companion to chat with or even install in their starship. That said, there are two major mechanical advantages that do go beyond the GM story and make computers valuable tools for the players too. First, computers can be programmed to use skills that the party is lacking. For example, a computer can be set to control a medical bed and heal injured party members if no one in the group has medical skills themselves. And second, computers allow players to take 20 on any recall knowledge checks provided the information can be accessed by the computer. If the computer is connected to a planet's infosphere, then that means players with 2 minutes to spare can take 20 on the vast majority of recall knowledge checks. And if they have secret files stored locally on the computer, then they can take 20 on that research as well. Computers in Starfinder are complex works of technology that function somewhat similar to vehicles in that there is a base chassis of sorts that is further customized and upgraded. The base stat for any computer is its tier. Tiers run from 1 to 10, with tier 1 computers being the least sophisticated and tier 10 computers being the largest, most powerful computers in the packed worlds. Every computer's tier serves as the foundation for every other statistic. Its cost, the difficulty to hack into it, the effectiveness of modules, and so forth. But a computer's tier should not be confused with item level, as computers do not have item levels. All starships come stock with a basic computer of a tier half that of the starship's tier. Therefore, a tier 4 starship comes equipped with a tier 2 basic computer, and a tier 7 starship has a tier 3 basic computer. Unless otherwise noted, these computers serve to manage the functions of the ship and serve no other purpose unless noted in their description or customized by the players. Although the tier of a computer largely varies with the level of the adventure it's in and the role it plays in the story, here are a few examples that were found in the official Starfinder adventure paths. Tier 1 computers are civilian grade. They are largely unsecured and are simple devices with very basic functions. Examples include common data pads, very simple electronic locks, and a room's environmental and lighting controls. Tier 2 computers include slightly upgraded versions of Tier 1s, such as the data pads of named NPCs and slightly more sophisticated computers like game consoles, infosphere browsing stations, or a business's lobby computer used for administrative functions. Most of what we today would call computer terminals appear to fall into Tier 3. Office workstations, laboratory data analysis computers, a marketing specialist computer, and so forth. If it's sitting on a desk or in a cubicle, or is in the office of someone other than the boss, it's likely a Tier 3 computer. A few other interesting examples are a lead scientist data pad, a heavily customized secure comm unit, a security room computer, and a computer controlling the locks on a prison cell. If low-grade security controls were Tier 3, then the mid-grade must be Tier 4. 
In fact, a security control room was the only example of a tier 4 computer that I could find in the adventures. And if mid-grade security control computers are tier 4, then the high-grade security control rooms are tier 5. A few other examples of tier 5 computers are a laboratory's master computer, the lab's server, a techno-magical hybrid computer with organic components in a black site lab, an executive's private computer, and a vacation resort's mainframe computer were all tier 5. I only found one example of a tier 6 computer, and it was a custom-built prototype workstation. And I was unable to find any examples of tier 7, 8, or 9 computers, but examples of tier 10 computers include the engine core of a space station, a major corporation's mainframe, and the computer core of a capital ship. Next, let's talk about size. Computers have bulk equal to its tier squared. For example, a tier 1 computer is 1 point of bulk, a tier 3 computer is 9 points of bulk, a tier 5 computer is 25 points of bulk, and so on. At first, this seems incredibly large, but the good news is the bulk of a computer may be reduced with a miniaturization upgrade. This upgrade costs 10% of the tier's base cost and lowers the computer's tier by 1 for the purposes of calculating size and bulk only. It can be purchased multiple times and lower the computer's tier for calculating bulk to a minimum of negative 1, and if reduced to tier 0, the computer is light bulk, and at tier negative 1, it is negligible bulk. Computers with light or negligible bulk can be worn or attached to communication devices, and those of bulk 25 or higher are most likely secured to the floor and not portable. So let's say you have a tier 3 computer that you would like to wear on your wrist with a holographic display. You would first purchase the computer at the tier 3 price of 1,250 credits. By default, this is a bulk 9 piece of hardware. So then you buy the miniaturization upgrade for 125 credits, that's 10% of the base price, and that lowers its tier to tier 2 for the purposes of size, making it now a bulk 4 item. You buy that upgrade a second time, spend another 125 credits, and it becomes the size of a tier 1 computer in bulk 1. At bulk 1, it is now the size of a data pad and can be held, but is still too large to wear. So you buy the miniaturization upgrade a third time, spend another 125 credits for a total of 375, and lower its size to tier 0, now making it a light bulk item that you can wear on your wrist. It still functions as a tier 3 computer in all other respects other than its size and bulk. A computer's bulk also sets the limit to how many user interfaces can connect to it, all computers, regardless of bulk, come with one user interface and have a maximum capacity of 10 user interfaces per point of bulk. For example, a large mainframe could have multiple workstations all attached to it. When a person has access to a computer, they have control over its basic functions. Basic functions include manipulating other simple devices, such as merely flipping a switch on or off, Turning lights on or off, turning music on or off, open or closing a door would all be examples of basic functions. Other basic functions would be things like automated bookkeeping or sorting data. The rule of thumb is if a task does not require a person to operate, then it is considered a basic function. But functions that would require a person to operate the computer require the use of a control module, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. Root access is a more advanced form of access and allows the user to do pretty much whatever they want with the device. These are admin permissions that let you view and edit secure information, alter the way the computer's modules work, turn off firewalls and other countermeasures, grant specific other users permissions to use secured modules, and so on. There are three ways a user can gain root access. The first, when the computer is purchased, their account can be granted root access permissions. Second, root access can be granted to any user by another user who already has root access permissions. 
or third by hacking into the computer, and we'll talk about that in a future video all about the basics of hacking. Modules define what a computer can do beyond its basic functions and come in four varieties. Control modules allow the computer's user to control other devices connected to the computer. For example, a security room's computer most likely has a control module that allows its user to manipulate security cameras. Secure data modules store information that should not be as easily accessed as information stored in the computer's basic functions. Upgrades improve how a computer operates. They could make the computer smaller and lighter, as we've already discussed, or make them more secure, give them a longer communications range, and more. And last, spell chips are a special type of module that converts spell gems into a computer chip that can be slotted into the computer. Spell gems are essentially the magic scrolls of Starfinder. Spell chips cost 10% more than their equivalent spell gem, and the caster gains a plus two circumstance bonus to any skill check involving the spell. The spent spell chips may be reloaded with another use of its spell at a cost of 90% of the original cost of the spell chip, and going deeper into how spell gems and spell chips work is probably beyond the scope of this video, but we will discuss them both in greater detail in a future episode of Basics of Starfinder. There is no hard limit to the number of modules a computer can have installed as long as its owner can afford them. Also note that modules are comprised of both hardware and software elements, making them difficult to remove and almost never can be removed in the heat of a battle. So now let's look at each of these modules in greater detail, starting with control modules. Control modules allow the computer's user to operate another device that is connected in some manner to the computer. Any device that can be controlled with a computer's basic functions do not need a special control module of their own. But you do need a control module to operate more complex devices like a spy drone, cameras, or a weapon turret. The cost of the control module is 10% the price of the device being controlled, including all accessories attached to the control device. For example, if the computer controls a sentry gun, the cost of the control module would be 10% the cost of the gun, plus 10% of the mount used to secure that weapon. In the case of autonomous devices like a robot, the control module doesn't grant complete control, but does allow the user of the computer to issue commands to the robot. When operating a device that requires a skill check or attack roll to operate, the computer can either allow the authorized user to make that skill check or attack roll, or the computer may make the check or roll itself. Computers that control weapons have proficiency in those weapons and attack bonuses equal to its tier. Control modules that manage devices that call for skill checks have skill bonuses equal to its tier times 2.5. So for example, a tier three computer controlling a sentry gun in a hallway has a ranged attack bonus of plus three. And a tier four computer with a control module that manages medical devices would make medicine checks with a plus 10 bonus. Secure data modules keep sensitive information secret and safe. Only users with root access and those specifically granted permission can view the information that is in a secure data module, and those modules are almost always further secured behind their own firewall as well. There is no set size limit to the amount of information a secure data module can store, such as 100 petabytes of information, but instead is limited to only being able to store information of one topic. It could be as small as a single screenplay or as large as the technical readouts of a moon-sized battle station. And it can include several different types of media, audio logs, video logs, 3D renderings, holographic schematics, as long as they are all related to that same one topic. Computers can securely store information on multiple topics, but must house each topic of information in its own secure data module. Although secure data modules have no hard size limit, the cost of the module is roughly based on the size of its contents, 
ranging from one credit for a single small specific topic such as a single video log to a thousand credits for truly large topics like the plans for a massive starship. Upgrades serve the function you would probably expect. They make the computer better in some way. As with other modules, you can have any number of upgrades, but unless otherwise noted, their benefits do not stack. Instead, you would need to install a higher quality version of the same upgrade to see increased benefits. Artificial personality upgrades may be installed to allow a computer to hold conversations with both users and individuals who lack access permissions with the computer. Computers with an artificial personality upgrade may be able to express and perceive emotions as well as humor, but do not truly possess free will or a soul as an android does. These computers do not possess consciousness and are limited to acting and conversing in the manner that they were programmed. The main benefit of artificial personality upgrades is the user is not limited to the standard user interfaces, but can freely converse with the computer instead. Also, computers with an artificial personality may make bluff, diplomacy, intimidate, and sense motive checks per the limits of their programming with skill bonuses equal to double the computer's tier. The hardened upgrade makes the computer more resilient. This increases its hardness value by 10 and grants a plus 8 bonus to savings throws against energy attacks and effects that specifically target computers or electrical systems. The range upgrade allows a computer to control devices with its control modules when that device is not physically connected to the computer. Range 1 connects a device within 100 feet. Range 2 connects a device within 1 mile. And Range 3 allows control of a device anywhere on the same planet. The self-charging upgrade essentially increases the computer's battery life. By default, all computers can function for 24 hours when not connected to a power supply, but the self-charging upgrade increases that to one week with the first upgrade and an additional week per upgrade beyond that. The last and perhaps most important upgrade is the security upgrade, but we will be discussing that as well as computer countermeasures in our next video, The Basics of Hacking. Now that we know what all the different pieces do, let's see how they fit together. For this example, I'm going to design a computer from one of my adventures that players are likely to want to interact with. It's a computer that operates the hangar inside of a starship that the heroes have infiltrated. Since this is an NPC computer, I'm not going to worry about cost and instead focus on its role in the story and how I expect the players to use it. First thing we need to determine is the computer's tier. I think this is just a typical computer terminal, so I'm going to set its tier at tier 3. That makes it a bulk 9 item, and I'm going to go one step further and say it's bolted down to the floor because you don't want these things rolling around or falling over on a starship. It comes with one user interface, and I figure the standard keyboard and touchscreen will work just fine. Now I need to figure out exactly what I want the computer to do. I want this computer to be able to open and close the interior doors. I want it to open and close the big exterior hangar door that opens into space. It should be able to view cameras that monitor the hangar and shuttles on landing approach. It should be able to cycle an airlock, control the hangar's lights, keep a log of ships coming and going, access the hangar's PA system, and also control a robot that is used to load and unload cargo. Now that I have my list, I separate the items on the list according to what is a basic function and what is going to need its own control module. I recall that basic functions are simple, do not require human interaction or the use of skills. So from this list, I decide that using the cameras and controlling the cargo robot will require their own control modules and the rest can be basic functions. An argument could be made for the PA system to require a control module too, but for my purposes, I'm going to let that just be a basic function. I also note that the log that details all ships coming and going might be sensitive information, so I put that in a secure data module. This gives me a pretty basic hangar control station. 
It is tier 3, 9 bulk, with a list of reasonable basic functions, 2 control modules, and 1 secure data module. All that's left is to set up some defenses in case the players want to try and hack into it, which you know they're going to do because they're players, and we'll examine that process in our next video about hacking. In this video we discuss the basics of computers. Computers serve a wide variety of uses to accommodate the game's story, but are also useful for players as well. They can be programmed to perform skills that the players do not have, and they also allow players to take 20 on any recall knowledge check pertaining to information available on the device or accessible by the device, for example, researching information on the planet's infosphere. Computers are ranked by tier. Tiers range from 1 to 10, with tier 1 computers being very simple devices like a common data pad, all the way to tier 10 computers like those managing a space station's power core. The tier of a computer determines its base price, the cost of modules and upgrades, and also sets the bonuses used by the computer when it performs tasks. The size of a computer is its tier squared in bulk. For example, a tier 3 computer is a 9 bulk device, but the bulk can be lowered by purchasing multiple applications of the miniaturization upgrade. When a user has access to a computer, they have control over its basic functions. They can send and receive messages, control minor functions like turning lights on and off, can view any information stored on the computer other than what is stored separately in secure data modules, they also may or may not be able to control any devices managed by the computer's control modules depending on if that control module allows users with basic access to use them. Root access is a more powerful form of computer access and can be thought of as admin permissions. If a user has root access, they can use any module, edit any information, grant or revoke the permissions of other users, and more. There are four broad categories of modules. First are control modules. Control modules allow the computer to control other devices like cameras, a turret, or spy drone. When a skill check needs to be made for a computer using a device, it makes the check with a bonus equal to its tier multiplied by 2.5. When a computer is controlling a weapon, it is considered to have proficiency in that weapon and has an attack bonus equal to its tier. Secure data modules allow a computer to hide valuable information from view. Information stored in a secure data module can only be viewed by users with root access or users who specifically have been granted permission to view or edit the information by someone who does have root access. These modules can be further secured by storing them behind firewalls, and we will discuss that in our Basics of Hacking video. Upgrades enhance how a computer operates. Artificial personality upgrades allow the computer to converse with others. They also grant computers the ability to make bluff, diplomacy, intimidate, and sense motive checks, and they make all of those skill checks with a bonus equal to two times the tier of the computer. The range upgrade allows control modules to manage devices that are not physically connected to the computer. The hardened upgrade makes computers more resilient so they can withstand more punishment before breaking, and the self-charging upgrade increases the computer's battery life. The last kind of upgrade is security upgrades, and that will be discussed in our Basics of Hacking video. With that, we'll bring this video to a close. If you found this video helpful, please give us a like, and don't forget to click that subscribe button and bell so you don't miss out on our future videos. Leave us a comment letting us know what topics you would like to see us cover in the future, and we can always be reached through our Twitter and Facebook pages too. If you would like to use some of the maps that we feature in our videos with your own games, you can find them at Maps of Mastery and Zero Hour. Links to those sites may be found in the description. Thanks for watching, take care, and we'll see you soon with more basics for your favorite tabletop games.